to the church at Corinth. And then, Father, we would know what he meant for us, the church today. Father, remind us that these words, while addressed to a particular church, has application for your church universal through the through history, through the ages. So help us to dig to the truth and understand what these words mean. Draw us unto yourself today. Convict the sinner who does not know you as Savior to find repentance and salvation. And Father, uh, convict us also of our sins and our waywardness that we would come to you and would leave our burdens here. For it's in Christ that we pray. Amen. If your Bibles are at hand, please turn to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter number 2. 2 Corinthians chapter number 2 verses 12 through 17. And the title is A Mouthful. And uh, when I get to the very end, you'll know why I've titled the passage this way. It is Perfume Parade Participants or Putrid Puke Peddlers. If you're here this morning, you're only one of two people in this room. You're Perfume Parade Peddler, which sounds like the better choice of the two. Or you're a Putrid Puke Peddler. And we'll get to the end. You'll see why it's labeled as such. My favorite theologian, uh, without a doubt, hands down, is the Apostle Paul. Aside from Jesus... No other person who's ever walked the face of the earth has, has ever been used by God more to formulate Christian doctrine than the Apostle Paul. He is responsible for transmitting more divine revelation in the New Testament era than any other human author. I hope it's not sacrilegious to say this, but when I get to heaven, I want to meet the Apostle Paul. I don't think that's my first priority by any means, but some million years later, after I've rejoiced and praised God, he lets me have a break from the throne. Maybe I'll meet Paul. I don't know how that works out. But Paul is one of my heroes. In fact, we often say things like, uh, we stand on the shoulders of giants. And the great history of the, of the church, those great uh, theologians of the history of the church that we admire and respect. And all those giants stand on the shoulders of the Apostle Paul as far as human authors and uh, human theologians go. Christ is the head of the church, and the Apostle Paul is one of the apostles that uh, God used to give us Scripture. In fact, he was so widely respected that listen to his contemporary, Simon Peter, says these words. Second Peter, and not, this is just this is not the text, but just the uh, introduction this morning to the text. Peter says this about Paul: Our beloved brother Paul wrote all, also wrote to you concerning the wisdom given him, verse sixteen, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand, and everybody says, "Amen, Peter." You got it is tough, which are ignorant. And unstable twist to their own destruction, as they do uh, the other scriptures. Three things you should know from this passage, what the Apostle Peter thought about the Apostle Paul. Three things. First, number one is this. He acknowledged that that Paul's words are uh, inspired of God. Now think about this for a second. When Paul and Peter met in the Jerusalem Council in Acts chapter 15, and and Peter and Paul met maybe for the first time face to face, uh, and Peter's been reading Paul's words in circulation for already for a few years here, and they meet in Acts 15 at the first Jerusalem Council. When Peter shakes Paul's hand, he's acknowledging that this guy writes with the same authorship, the same authority as Moses did. Now that blows my mind that a very devout, God-fearing Jew like Peter himself, when he met Paul, said his writings are on par with Moses and Isaiah and Jeremiah and Daniel. And all those guys before him, he said that God gave, they're inspired of God. Number two, he says what well, we all should agree, that Paul's words are sometimes very profound. And lastly, he said his words were Scripture. So let me agree with Peter this morning, and I hope that you guys agree with Peter, not necessarily with me, but agree with Peter anyway when I say this. When Paul speaks, he speaks with authority as one who held the office of apostle. And no person today holds the office of apostle. No person today holds the office of apostle because in Acts chapter 1, when they went to replace uh, Judas who fell away, they had very, st- and this is just my tangent here, a very strict criteria for holding the office, the office of apostle. He must have been with Christ since his baptism, been with Christ through his ministry, saw Christ crucified, and saw Christ after the resurrection. So if a person claims to hold the office of apostle today, unless they're about 2,000 years old, They don't meet the biblical criteria outlined by Peter very explicitly in Acts chapter 1. Now, we all are apostles in lowercase sense. We all are sent of God to go out. We all go out. We're sent. That's what the apostle means. But to hold the office of apostle, 
Because that criteria is so narrowly defined, you can't hold that office today unless you're about 2,000 years old, have lived during that time, and saw the things that uh, Peter demands of you, as it says in Acts chapter 1. That's important because here is one of the things the office of apostle allows, allowed them to do, to write Scripture. To write Scripture. I do not write Scripture. I read Scripture. I expound on scripture, I illustrate things. I hope that when you hear a sermon that all I'm doing is, uh, is amplifying what God's word has already said. That all I'm doing when I preach the word is not to give you a new word from God. That would be adding to God's word. But I explain the word already given. God's church is built upon Christ. And he said the, 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 the apostles laid the foundation and through their written and spoken words. And we have in our hands the written words of the apostles uh, as God would have us. That's a tangent of mine. If somebody says, comes to you and says, I've got a word from God for you, they're saying in a roundabout way that I am exercising a gift of an apostle to give you new revelation of God, and they cannot do that. God's canon of Scripture has been closed, and I hope that we understand how important that is because if we can just add willy-nilly to God's Word, who's to say someone comes along, say, in the 19th century and says, the angel Moron Moroni came to me with these texts, or in the 7th century and says, the, well, the angel Gabriel came to me in a cave somewhere near Mecca. Who's to say if the canon of Scripture is open that we can't just add to it? God's can of scriptures. That's a tangent of mine. So that wasn't meant to be preached. I just want to throw that out there that Peter gives weight to Paul's words. And so this morning, when we open the, the words of the Apostle Paul, I want to understand them as Paul meant them to be understood. In fact, one of the cool things I think about preaching, and I like preaching through uh, Paul's epistles, is you get to oftentimes open the book of Acts and see what was happening historically in his life at the time that he's, that he's writing these words, where he was, to which church he's writing to, uh, the context of his words. The book of Acts, the first uh, eight chapters or so, is about the early church in Jerusalem. And then you get to about chapter 9 or so, and then you find this man named Saul from Tarsus. And he, on the Damascus road, as he's persecuting Christians, as he's going from house to house, driving Christians out of Jerusalem, and all the way along, he's driving out the way along the way, right? He's driving out Christians. He's holding the coats of those that stoned Stephen. The first time we meet the apostle Paul, who then was called Saul. God blinds him of the Damascus road. A few days later, he recovers his sight. He, he surrenders to Christ, to the ministry, to the Gentiles. And the book of Acts, from Acts chapter 9 to the end of the book of Acts, basically is the life of the Apostle Paul in early church history. We have three missionary journeys of the Apostle Paul. We get to see his arrest. We get to see his trip going to Rome, a shipwreck on Malta at the end of, of the book of uh, Acts. We get to see him almost make it to Rome, and the canon of the Scripture closes. And that's where secular history picks up the ball and tells us that the Apostle Paul did make it to Rome. The Apostle Paul not, not only made it to Rome, but he was, in fact, was uh, beheaded in Rome under the reign of Nero. So that's outside the Bible, but it is, in fact, as established as anything else in early church history. Now, the Apostle Paul is given credit for writing 13 epistles. We have all 13 epistles in our Bible, and every time Paul wrote something, he put his name to it. Some folks say that he wrote Hebrews. I don't think he wrote Hebrews. If he did, he didn't name it. And if, if he did write Hebrews, that's number 14 given to Paul, but I don't think that he did. And that's a battle for another day. We're not going to split the church over who wrote the book of Hebrews. We all agree that God inspired whoever the author was. But when Paul wrote to these churches... We get to read the book of Acts and see why he wrote it to these churches, what was going on in the context of this. And so I hope that when we go through this text, we do that. To this morning, we're going to be looking at Paul writing to the church at Corinth. And every, and I say this a lot, but every time I want to mention this, every time I drive by a church called Corinth Baptist Church, I cringe a little bit. Because they named their church after the most dysfunctional church in the Bible. Corinth was a messed up church. When I hear folks pine for the good old days of uh, the first century Christians where life was easy and they would submit themselves to the authority of the apostles, I know for sure one thing, they have never read their Bibles. Because the, Corinth, the church of Corinth was messed up. 
Now, before we get to the text, this is all still introduction here. Paul is, you should know this about the Apostle Paul, he's called a task theologian, a task theologian, because when he wrote to a church, it was not from some ivory tower, it was with a very specific task in mind. He set out to solve a problem in the church, which was either moral, a moral problem in the church, or it was a theological problem in the church, one of the two. Now, if there was a church at the time of Paul, uh, with very few problems in it, and there probably were several of those, we wouldn't know about it because he only wrote to messed up churches. That's just the fact. I'm oversimplifying to some degree, but the point is this. When Paul set pen to paper to write to your church, it was a messed up church. If you were in a church in Asia Minor somewhere, and you went to your mailbox to check your church's mail, and I'm using, being facetious here, and you opened the mailbox, and you got a letter from Paul, your heart probably sank. Because he was writing to criticize you. Because you had either gone in one or two bad paths. You had gone to immoral behavior or immoral doctrine. You were not practicing orthodoxy, right teaching, or you're not practicing orthopraxy, right behavior. And one of those two problems were always the case when Paul wrote to the church. And in Corinth, it was both. Bad doctrine creates bad behavior. Today, we'll focus on a part of a letter of the church at Corinth, of the church I had both bad teaching and bad behavior. And among the problems in the church, I'll put this on the screen very quickly here. If you don't know anything about Corinth, the church of Corinth, how messed up it was. Here are some problems you'd read in the book of Corinth, read uh, in the letter of Corinthians if you <coughs> took the time. <coughs> I'm getting choked up here. <coughs> and it's not emotional, it's just corn dust, I guess. I don't know. So here's some of the problems the church of Corinth had. <clears throat> they had claimed spiritual maturity over the others. Some folks in the church said, I'm more spiritual than these folks. I'm, you know, they got puffed up with pride. Um, they were suing folks in public courts. As a church, you should never take your brother, sister in Christ to public court unless it's an absolute last resort. And Paul criticized them for so quickly taking each other to, to civil courts. They're abusing the Lord's Supper. Folks show up to take the Lord's Supper, and some got drunk, and some were left out. Some ate all the Lord's Supper bread, and some folks were left out. Paul said he'd abused the Lord's Supper. Uh, they abused the spiritual gifts. They were misusing the spiritual gifts. Paul had to write to talk about tongues and prophetic, all those sort of stuff. He had to, he had to iron out and, because they messed it up. There was drunkenness in the church, and there was sexual misbehavior. And this is just to name a few of the problems at the church in Corinth. And if... I were privileged to have pastored a church uh, that Paul had planted in the first century. My desire would be to fly under the radar so low I'd hit a mountain. I'd fly beneath the radar so low that Paul would never even think about me as a church because if he thought of me and wrote to me, there was a problem. I would hope to have pastored a church at that time that was so morally and ethically sound that he would never have to write nor visit. You get what I'm saying with this this morning? And he wrote the church at Corinth at least three times, probably more. We have 1 Corinthians. Now, now, you know, when you look at your Bibles, the books of the Bibles have been named, but Paul didn't name the books of the Bible, and Jesus, no, they were just put by, by human authors named the books of the Bible. 1 Corinthians is called 1 Corinthians because we think that's Paul's first letter to the church, and 2 Corinthians is 2 Corinthians because that's the second letter we have, but it's most certainly 3 Corinthians. We don't have a 2 Corinthians. And I could spend time with you for an hour talking about why that is at some point outside of church. But just know this, that Paul wrote to the church of Corinth several times, which means to your ear this morning, the church was messed up morally and doctrinally. So let's jump in the text in what I would call 3 Corinthians which you would make call in your Bible 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 12 through 13. Paul says this, When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was opened for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of them and went on to Macedonia. Now, I said earlier that when you read the writings of Paul, you can always open the book of Acts and find out what he's talking about, which event in history. And this happens to describe his third missionary journey, which took place around 58 AD. Acts chapter 20, I'm going to now show you this passage. Acts chapter 20, verse 1. 
After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed for Macedonia. And that is Luke's historical account of Acts chapter number 21, where, where he writes that Paul left Troas, went to Macedonia. In 2 Corinthians, Paul tells the church at Corinth why he did that. To understand verse 12, we've got to know why he's looking for Titus. We've got to know why he left Troas so quickly to go find Titus. What's the context of the open door he's talking about in these passages here? So first things first, Acts chapter 20 happens after Acts chapter 19. You guys know that. But what you might ask happened in Acts chapter 19. Well, I love that you asked that question because in Acts chapter number 19, uh, Paul is preaching in Ephesus. And people were so changed by the gospel preaching in Ephesus that they burned their divination books and stopped worshiping idols. That's Acts chapter number 19. Look at the map here. Paul is in Troas. He just left Ephesus, Acts chapter 19, to go up to Troas to find Timothy. And he preached a revival meeting that was so great it changed the culture of Ephesus. They burned their divination books, the Ouija cards, the tarot cards, the Ouija boards, right? They burned that stuff, and it was, it was such a hit to local economy that the local silversmith named Demetrius said, this guy Paul and the Christ he preaches is bad for business because folks have stopped buying household idols from us because Paul so changed the culture. Because that's what happens when revival comes to a town. Somehow we think that revival happens in a church when you've sang songs you liked and you've heard preaching that, it, that it tickled your ears or, or whatever, scratched your ears or, or made you laugh or have a warm fuzzy and you go out in the parking lot and that feeling is gone. Revival is not a feeling in your heart. Revival is manifested best by a change in a culture. And the church at Ephesus uh, was revived and was, uh, it took to Paul's preaching to the point where it manifested in right doctrine Right behavior. They threw away their idols. They burned their witchcraft books. It put the silversmith out of work. You guys see that? When we have revival, we're saying we need to be changed, right? We need, and it's manifested by culture changing, not how we feel in our hearts. Because you can get excited over Tennessee beating Alabama in a football game. But that's not revival, is it? Not at all. A feeling's not revival. It's a change of behavior is revival. So what happens in Acts 19? Well, to give you a very brief synopsis, so after this great revival in Ephesus, uh, the, the local silversmith goes to the local civil authority and says, we've got to get Paul arrested. And the guy says, he's done nothing wrong. And Paul says, I'm going to leave the church here at Ephesus in the hands of some good friends. I'm going to go to Troas and look for Timothy. So Paul left town and went to Troas to meet, uh, to meet Titus. Excuse me. Now, why does he want to see Titus so bad? Well, Titus is coming from the church at Corinth. Paul left on the second missionary journey. He left Titus in Corinth and said, report back to me at Troas next spring and give me a report in the church, what's happening in the church of Corinth. And so he goes to Troas to meet Titus, and Titus is not there. So what does Paul do while he's in Troas waiting for Titus to get there? He preaches the gospel. And a revival breaks out in, in, in Troas. It establishes a church there. And then a second great revival happens in Troas at the preaching of the Apostle Paul. He waited a week. And the, the phrase open door re refers to God giving Paul the opportunity to preach the gospel there in Troas. And they'd come, come to Christ in, in bushels. In fact, I want to show you the phrase, the open door. Look at 1 Corinthians 16 and then Revelation 3. I want to show you how the phrase open door is used in the New Testament to describe a door of opportunity. 1 Corinthians 16, 8 through 9, Paul, the same author, says this in the same series of letters. He said this, But I'll stand Ephesus until Pentecost for a wide door for effective work has happened to me, and there are many, and there are many adversaries. Now, Paul said Ephesus Three years, and he preached the gospel there because the open door of opportunity was there in Ephesus. He stayed there three years. Revelation 3.8, uh, Christ says to the church of Philadelphia, I know your works. Behold, I've set before you an open door which no one is able to shut. I know that you have a, but little power, and yet have kept my word and have not denied my name. So both cases in the New Testament, the phrase open door is used to describe, as Paul does here very plainly, a door of opportunity. God is working the hearts of people to receive the gospel. Folks are hearing the good news preached, repenting of sin, coming to Christ and finding salvation. That's the door of opportunity. And now I want you guys to know this. Paul left two revival meetings, one in Ephesus and one in Troas, to go find his buddy, 
Titus. Let's look at that text one more time. 2 Corinthians 2, 12-13. With that in mind. Now, this text now it means something to you, doesn't it? When I came to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, even though a door was open for me in the Lord, my spirit was not at rest because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I took leave of, of them and went to Macedonia. Let me say about this passage two things you should know. First is this. God placed the burden in the heart of the Apostle Paul for his friend Titus. God placed the burden in the heart of the Apostle Paul for his friend Titus. But God had also placed the burden of the gospel preaching in the heart of Paul. So what's Paul to do? He's left revival in Ephesus to come to Troas. He's going to now leave the revival in Troas to go to Macedonia. He's looking for his friend Titus. How does Paul resolve the conflict? He does it this way. He, lives, he leaves able-bodied men in those two cities to preach the gospel in those churches while he goes and looks for his buddy. Now, Jared, you've wasted five minutes of my life explaining this simple verse in this passage. What on earth does it mean for me today that Paul would leave, his, leave two revivals to go look for his buddy in Macedonia? What on earth does it mean for me today? Paul uses this example to show his love for the church at Corinth, which is a picture of Christ, isn't it? Guys, the church at Corinth had a lot of problems. We looked at those. We mentioned them just a little bit earlier. In fact, the church at Corinth, I'm not making this up. They said, Paul, you can't preach, and you're not a real apostle, and you're ugly. And if they thought about that, they would have said, and your mother wears combat boots. But it's not in the Corinthians. But they would have said it if they thought to say that, or maybe combat sandals, since it's the Roman world. They said, Paul, you can't preach. You're not a true apostle, and you're ugly. And then they misbehaved all the time when he wasn't there. In spite of all of this happening in Corinth, Paul left two revival meetings to go find his buddy from that church to get an update on their progress. For Paul so loved Corinth that he left Troas. Listen carefully. Those who you love the most can hurt you the deepest. Paul, you ain't an apostle. You can't preach and you're ugly. Those who love you the who you love the most can hurt you the deepest. If you doubt that, get married. Or have kids or get in a relationship, or have a good friend. Those who love you the most hurt you the deepest. Paul loved the church at Corinth so much, even though they were at the most unlovely, to go find them. Who, who are you the most unlovely to? Who are you the most impatient with? Odds are it's somebody you love. And I'm preaching to myself this morning, right, Michelle? She says yes. <laughs> So ignore that. I just preached myself the last two minutes, right? But it speaks highly of Paul that he would leave two revival meetings to find a friend. It reminds me, and it should remind you, that Christ had so loved the church that he would leave heaven to die on a cross. And when Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, all those letters he wrote to them, there was always, I imagine, pen, there was always tears in his eyes and in the, in the pages of the, of, the, of, the, of the manuscripts were stained with his tears. He worried himself sick over the church at Corinth. A so much he sent his friend Titus to go minister to them and to stay with him for, for them for years. And so when Titus doesn't show up in Troas, he says, I got to leave the work of God here to go find Titus because I'm so concerned about Corinth. So for the next several chapters, and he's writing this years later to the church of Corinth, why he met them in such urgency. It's why he's writing this, to remind them. He loved them so much, that's why he did this. So for the next, the next five chapters of the 2 Corinthians, from chapter 2 to chapter 7, it's one big doxology. It's one big outbreak of Paul's songs. And he starts in verse 14 with a big thank you. Verse 14, But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. 
To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. Who is sufficient for these things to preach this gospel, to give this good news? For we are not. Like so many peddlers of God's word, but, at, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Now let's briefly unpack this. Paul uses the analogy of this military triumphal procession of the Roman army of his day. And if you were somewhere in some village in the empire somewhere, and you saw a Roman general marching in your town with a, with a, with a whole army escort with him, you would see slaves walking beside him with an incense bowl, with burning with incense. And if you were on the winning side and you welcome the general, you're like, all right, our general won. But if you're on the losing side, if you're the ones perishing, your heart probably sank because that meant that your army and your generals were in the field somewhere dead as this general comes now to sack the city. Paul said, we are the fragrance of God to a world that is perishing. To those who turn from sin and find peace in Christ, we're the sweet aroma of the grace of God and forgiveness. Paul said, through us spreads a fragrance of the knowledge of, of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved. How sweet it is. Guys, you're called to smell like Jesus. There's a balm in Gilead. And it smells like Old Spice. The preaching of Jesus ought to be a beautiful fragrance. Living like Christians in a pagan world ought to be refreshing to pagans. You know, God called us to be a light in the dark world, not to be the sun in the solar system. We're called to be salt that preserves the world, not the, all the salt of the ocean, just to be the salt that preserves your community. But those who turn from the gospel, the gospel preaching, find our fragrance, as Paul said, repulsive from death to death. Those who hear the good news preached, it sounds like bad news. And those watching the parade as the Roman general comes in with his army interpret this of one of two ways. Our general won or our general lost. The same incense bowls that burned when the slaves brought us through your town either smelled good to you or it terrified you to death. The same gospel that saves some condemns others. The good news is that you're a sinner on the road to hell and destruction and you will die in your sins. There's nothing you do to save yourself. That's the bad news of the gospel. But the good news of the gospel preaching is that Christ died for sinful men. There are men in Paul's day, just like there's men in our day, who peddle another gospel. Now the word peddle, I like that word. Think what the word peddle means. In the ancient world, it's like somebody hawking on a street corner. Step right up, step right up. In the, in the ancient world, it, was, it spoke of the guy who watered down his wine and sold it to you as the real stuff. It's the greasy used car salesman that, that stuffs his, uh, his uh, transmission full of sawdust. That wasn't you, Zach. If it is, got to repent of that like Zacchaeus. you got to come before that. <laughs> Paul said those, those who peddle the gospel... It's like the guy that rents air time on TBN at 3 in the morning to sell the holy oil and holy rags and uh, holy handkerchiefs. It's like the guy, Jim Baker, who sells slop buckets on TBN. You know, it's end of the world, but he's going to make a buck off of you. He's going to be gone, but you're going to need the slop buckets to survive the worst on the earth. And I understand the food is horrible, but thankfully they give you a bucket. That's just what it is. It comes in a bucket. Paul said there's Mike Murdoch and Ken Copeland and Jim Baker in the ancient world who peddle the gospel for profit. But Paul said we're not like that. Listen carefully. Paul said we're called to love Christ and we do so by loving his church. And Paul is a prime example in this passage of how we love and care for the church. He left Ephesus and Troas in hands of good, able men who preached the gospel and kept those churches going while he went to find uh, Titus from a church that didn't like him at all. And I hope that this morning, he said, it reminds me of somebody else who left his throne in heaven for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That he left the throne of heaven. To, Christ came to earth, incarnated as a man, would die on a Roman cross, would take upon his shoulders your sin to save you. Guys, Christ is the best example of how much we should love the church. 
And let me ask the question, it's by illustration, how much does Christ love the church? If you fishermen, you might like this. Was it this much he loved the church? Did Christ love the church this much? Did Christ love the church this much? No, Christ loved the church this much. Let us pray. Father, come before you this morning.